Hi. Um, there are plenty of resources out there, lots of books and articles that describe this ideal scenario for creating a responsive site from scratch, usually. But how do you make your site or your sites responsive when you don't have that luxury of starting everything from scratch? How can you fit uh, transitioning your site towards becoming responsive? How can you fit such a project when you have a massive workload, when you have a massive list of other business requirements and other projects that you have to be working on? We found ourselves in this situation when we decided that we were going to make our main site, Ubuntu.com, responsive. We knew we wanted definitely to make that transition, but it really sounded like this massive undertaking and something almost impossible to manage. And we did have some hiccups along the way, but there were a few things that we did in this project that we think that other teams can do on their own sites or on their client sites that can make a difference and that can make the process a little bit easier. And if nothing else, at least you'll be able to see that you're not the only one in this position and where you just can't start from a clean slate. So the first thing that you need to understand is, not, is that it's, it doesn't really matter how much you want to make your site responsive or your, your site's responsive, that will not automatically make that your team or your company's priority. The most important thing will still be keeping your site updated with new content and with new campaigns, whatever you usually need to do to maintain a living and breathing website. So you can't just alienate the business and ignore the other projects that you need to be working on at the same time. So it's important to remember that it doesn't matter how hard you want to make that transition. It's, it's really not about what you want and it's important to keep these other priorities in check throughout the process. You can't just jump straight into the fun parts. If you have, you have m many other projects that you have to be working on, on at the same time, so you are gonna really have to understand uh, that it will take time to get to where you want to in this project. You, it's important that you keep persistent and you're gonna have to be very positive and you have, you're gonna have to be very patient. And you're gonna need to understand what these other thousands of things that you need to be working on are, that your team needs to be working on are, when these other things need to be worked on, when they will need to be released, how long they will take to complete, and if there's anything at all that can be deprioritized so that the responsive project gets prioritized. We knew we were not going to be able to just sit down for three or six months or nine months or whatever and just focus on this project and just finish it in one go. Our project took several months to get done, and in a way, it's still ongoing. We're still working on it. And there were moments where none of us were working on it at all, because there were just other projects that had priority. But this had all been really well defined as part of the initial plan, so we were fine with it. We were okay with it. We were expecting these moments. This is a very simplified view of our schedule with just the responsive project parts in it. Usually our schedule looks more like this. So defining the constraints of the project is key and it, it will also help in planning the project and then dividing it into chunks. So you don't have the luxury of just fixing everything. So everyone should know, everyone in the team, everyone should know what you can and, and what you just can't do. You should know what the key goals are for the first version at least and what's out of scope, which is you can't touch, you can't do. In our case, early on, we knew that we were not going to be able to change the content of a site. We were not going to have time to rewrite anything, the words to make them mobile friendly, to make them shorter or easier to read. That was going to be exactly the same. We were also not going to be able to restructure the site, change the information architecture. We were not going to be able to change the navigation. It's going to stay the same and we knew we were not going to update the visual direction. Our guidelines were very well established. That was not the point of the project, to redesign it in that way. And we also knew that we couldn't change the existing design for large screens. 
So if you were going to see the site in a large screen before and after the transition to being responsive, the site was going to look exactly the same before and after. So everyone knows that breaking a large project down into small chunks makes it less daunting and more attainable. And you should definitely do this, but breaking it down, that process is not necessarily easy. A way to start breaking things down into smaller chunks is to just start thinking, okay, what, the, what do we just need to do ahead of other things? What needs to come first? For example, uh, we needed to clean up our CSS first or convert your grid to percentages. One thing that we did that was very positive in our case was listing, we just listed all the different pages in our site, just made a really long list, and we estimated how long it might take to QA and to then fix each one once we applied some responsive CSS to it, to, to the site. And if your site doesn't work with pages, maybe you can list all the components or the modules or journeys or sections, whatever. And by doing this and then going through the list and checking things off, the work becomes more achievable and you start getting this sense of accomplishment. You know, you're getting something done. And you also are able to get a good overview of the amount of work that will need to be done. And in our case, our estimate was actually a little bit too pessimistic when we did it, which made it an even more positive experience because we were checking pages off much faster than we initially thought we were going to. All of this planning can be done in a very low-key way. We usually just, just all get together in a room for a few hours and we write everything down in post-it notes we just then sort through the notes that we have, we start dividing them. And for example, if you wrote down all the requirements for your project, maybe then you start dividing them by priority. Or if you wrote down all the projects that you need to work on at the same time as this project, then you start dividing them by date that they have to be completed. Or maybe a mix of both things. When you, when you do this kind of thing, then you start getting this visual picture in front of you and it makes it a lot more understandable to then pl plan the project. So this is the, the fun part at the end of a, maybe a little bit more boring part of planning. It's like a little reward for all the hard work of, of planning. When you're working on a responsive site, it's not really enough to look at prototypes, for example, in Firefox responsive mode. And you can use, there are open device labs, uh, you can use one if there's one in your area. I, I did have a quick look in the official site and I only saw one listed in Poland in Krakow. So I'm not, I don't know if the list is up to date, but that was all I could find. But anyway, it's much more fun and practical to get your own devices. Go shopping for as many devices as you can. Uh, look at your analytics. These, are, these were our analytics a few months ago, uh, with the data that you have, and see which are the most relevant to you. So these, these were the ones that were more relevant to us, and maybe by the top three or by the top five, if you can do that. And these devices should be for testing only. They should always be available for anyone who needs to test the site. They shouldn't be uh, the device that someone else brings home at the end of the day. And as the project evolves, the list of devices you need will start to grow bigger and you can keep on getting new devices depending on your needs and also obviously on your budget. We, for example, when we started getting a few bug reports uh, on this, from the same device that we didn't have and from the same operating system, that was, uh, that was when we knew, okay, that's, that's another device that we should definitely get, get one of our own to test. So this is a key idea about not starting from scratch when you just don't have that luxury. It's all about reusing what you can. It's all about evolution and not revolution. You're not going to start from scratch and you can't redesign everything that you think is wrong. That's just not going to be possible. So you need to create this habit of recycling and, and reusing because it's going to save your team and your company and your clients time and money. And things that you can reuse are content, your navigation patterns, your components, existing CSS even, frameworks, the visual direction, 
your style guides or your scripts. And you can do that not only from your site that you're going to be working on, but other sites that you work on, other products uh, in your company, other teams in your company. What we're talking about here today is the opposite of starting from a clean slate. So it's, it's really important that you are able to identify what are the good things or good enough things in the way that, you're, that you work and the way that you've created your site that you can reuse. In our case, we had our brand, which is well-defined. It's a strong brand. We had our font, which is a big part of the brand and that we just had to use. There was just no way around that. We had our existing style guide, which we had spent a lot of time creating before this project. And we had the information architecture. Like I said before, it wasn't perfect, but we had that. It was something that we could reuse. And the same with the content that we had. And it's also about reusing not only what you've done before, but also what other people have done before. We reused the grid from the Ubuntu phone designs. So it wasn't our team, the web team, that created the grid that we then used in uh, mobile screens. It was the team that designed the phone. We just took it from them. For large screens, as I've mentioned before, we reused the design of the site that had been done before it became responsive. So we didn't come up with a new design for large screens. And it didn't matter that it was designed with large screens in mind. It's about being clever about how you use the time that you do have available. And we did not have time to do this again. We also reused and adapted a grid created by an online tool called Gridinator, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was very useful when we were working on our responsive grid. There are other tools like that. Uh, I, I can think of grid, grid pack, I think. It's also useful. Um, we reused a script created by someone else for our image solution. We didn't do that. And in the first iteration of our documentation, we used a similar structure to the documentation of Bootstrap. So it, it, just, it was just a good structure. It made sense. So we just kind of took it and copied it. A good thing to think to get you in this frame of mind is to think, if you had just one hour, what would you do in that one hour to improve the site, to get it closer to that goal? So get used to this kind of thinking, because it means that you cannot possibly have time to do every single thing that you want to fix. It's not possible in one hour. So it makes you focus on the most important thing that you can do to get you closer to having that responsive side or whatever your goal is, maybe it's something else. As the web team, we oversee lots of different websites, not just the main ubuntu.com and canonical.com sites. We provide design guidance, and we're in charge of producing guidelines that other teams and people in the Ubuntu community can also use on their projects. So we knew that whatever we were going to do on ubuntu.com was going to, at some point, be used by other people and uh, other teams on their own sides. So for this to work, flexibility and simplicity are key, and standardization is very important. Maybe about a year before we did this project, we had uh, a week sprint where we rationalized a lot of our designs uh, and our design patterns and components, and we created our web style guide. We did not create new designs. We didn't redesign anything. We used what we already had, and we just cleaned it off duplicates. We merged elements that just looked too similar to others, so that the style then became much easier to manage and to understand. And this was a really huge step that then helped the responsive project to run a lot smoother. Doing this documentation and having this bird's eye view of your styles and of your patterns is really important and it really helps you to focus on reuse. A good way to test the code and the assumptions that you make along the way is to experiment in smaller projects instead of just jumping straight into the big scary site. 
We did this in two projects. One was Ubuntu Insights, which is a, like a resource center. And it was our first fully mobile first and responsive project. And for example, from this site, we took away the main navigation pattern that we created for it. And what we did for here, we did, what we did here, then we reused in the following responsive projects. And it was also in this smaller project that we created our adjusted responsive typographic scale. So it was here that we learned that we noticed that we couldn't just simply proportionally decrease the size of our fonts for smaller screens. There was a lot of tweaking that had to be done, especially in headings to make the text easier to read in small screens. And what we created here, then we used in all the other projects. We also worked on the redesign of our other main site, canonical.com, which is tiny compared to ubuntu.com, but it had to be finalized, it had to be completed before the main one. And here it was when we started to use SVG images for interface elements and for icons. And it was here that we first introduced Modernizer for feature detection. It's important to keep a record of the decisions while you're working throughout these projects because people might be away and they might be on holiday, they might be sick, and because you're always so busy and you always have to do so many things, sometimes decisions are made in the spur of the moment and it's just important to keep a record of that. During this project, we kept this record in Basecamp. Our meeting notes were in Basecamp. Or decisions that had been made between designers or developers so that in that way they were searchable and other people, if they weren't there, at least they got notified of what the decision was and they could participate in the conversation if they wanted to. Lately, we've been using uh, another tool called LeanKit, but we still use Basecamp as well to keep a record of things. <clears throat> So with so much preparation and smaller projects that you did beforehand, smaller tasks that were done and were completed, that final push, those final few weeks were a lot easier for us. We did two key things in preparation for this project that really simplified our lives and that I think that you can also do in your project. The first one was to have a well-defined style guide. So go through the existing patterns in your site, go through all the components. You can just take screenshots and put them in folders, and then you, you can just see where the variations are, where you can merge things, and you can decide what the, the rules are gonna be. And you should also make sure that your CSS then reflects these rules and these decisions that you make. And you can take inspiration from various style guides that are out there, or just go through them to check if there's anything that you forgot to consider in your style guide. And your style guide can be more or less detailed, but it's going to create a framework for the work that you're gonna be doing later on. And it will then make it easier for people in, within your team to communicate about the design. And this is of course easier said than done, it takes time but it will save so much time later on that I really must say it's a really important step. <clears throat> the second thing that we did was to convert the grid that we were using in our framework before to using percentages. So before we were using pixels and then we just used percentages. But we still left the site contained in the fixed width container. Converting the grid to percentages is something that can also be very time consuming and it's going to be a collaboration between the designers and the developers. And it's something that's not going to be visible except in the code because the site will still look exactly the same, but it's a really huge step in the right direction, the direction that you want to take later on. So I'd recommend anyone in a similar position to try these out. One of the earlier steps that we took into converting our CSS to be responsive was to create a document with some responsive rules. It was not a very long document. But with this document, the developers 
were able to take a few days aside to just work through the existing grid and add some responsiveness. And in that document, we did try to follow some common patterns, but we also tried to be opinionated when we could so that the developers could see it as a useful template to follow. Th this is just a, an example of some of the rules that we had. And doing this also meant that the designers could be doing something completely different. They could be working on something else and the developers could just move the project forward. So it's about being clever with how you use the time available and the resources and the people available. And on the same note, one of the trickiest parts for us was dealing with the navigation because Ubuntu.com has several navigation layers and it also has a really big fat footer. So instead of one of us just taking a week and trying to work through a solution, then, then send it off to be built and designed, it was a lot faster and it was a lot more fun to just lock ourselves in a room, a few of us in a room for two hours, and just think of ideas, just sketching ideas. So what we did was we looked at other people's solutions. We just opened their websites and we talked through them and we just sketched how those solutions might look for our site if we were using them. And we talked about how they wouldn't work, where they wouldn't work. And in the end, we arrived at what we thought was a good first solution that we could try for us. And when I say we, we arrived at a good first solution, I mean, a sketch on paper. That was how we arrived at it. So if you don't have time to follow a rigorous user experience process, that's just not, that's not the end of the world. That's just how things are. Sometimes you just have to go with something that is fast and cheap, but just making sure that you're using all the expertise in your team and using your time wisely. And maybe using people in other teams that you can access. And that's usually a much more fun exercise and also a nice break from other work that you have to do. So finally, you're going to have to release something at some point. Getting that first version, that first iteration live is really important, even if it has some bugs and it's going to have some bugs. It, it always does. Uh, and without the improvements that in, a di in an ideal world you would be able to, to do, you would have time to do, and you would have to resources to make. But without just releasing it, that, that first release, you are going to be maintaining two versions of your code, and that can be unsustainable very, very quickly. And once you're live, it's also a good idea to set up a process to revisit the work frequently. It's important to keep track of the design patterns and you can set up, for example, a, a review every six months to keep things clean and efficient, to remove duplicates that might appear. It always happens. And to just do the regular maintenance and revision in your work. It's really important to be able to look back and discuss how you can improve your processes and your designs and your code. In our case, a few months after the first release, we did a sprint to go through our patterns again. And we were able to examine them more deeply, like to the finest detail. And when we did that, we were also able to improve the documentation that we had created initially and the style guide as well. <clears throat> so since we launched the first iteration of uh, responsive Ubuntu.com, we kept on working on the project as usual alongside other projects. Since then, we were able to create a vanilla framework that contains all the base styles like font sizes and spacing, but that is also a little bit more modular that, than the first iteration was. And then we separated the styling bits into different themes that can be applied to the base style framework. And we also now use our own SAS grid instead of the one that was originally created with Gridinator, that other tool. Everything also is versioned now so people can use the more stable stuff if they want to, or if they want to, they can just try out the latest, more experimental things that we've been doing in the framework. And since the first iteration, we've also moved to using Git and, and GitHub. 
and using uh, Travis CI to test. Our documentation used to be static HTML files that someone had to go in and manually update. And we now moved to using SAS docs. So it's a living documentation. It's, it's generated automatically from our SAS files. Uh, I, I know that there's going to be a talk tomorrow morning about living documentation, though, so that might be interesting in relation to this. We've also applied our responsive framework in the meantime to various new sites. And we were able to apply these new styles with much, without much effort. And we created these new sites a lot more quickly compared to starting everything from scratch and compared to when we used to do things before. Obviously, each site always needs a little bit of some tweaks depending on the needs. But this proved to us that the code that we had created and the focus on reusability was really useful. So now the code that we have is not only responsive, but it, it looks great. And it's also reusable, which saves us time and which we can share. And that obviously makes everyone happy. And we've got plans for the future. There's always things that we want to do better. Things are never done. For example, we have plans to implement the picture element soon. That's something we want to do. And we also want to do things like regression testing to make life easier for us developing the site. So I hope some of these tips were useful for you and that you can use in your own projects. So remember, focus on, on reusability. Focus on using your time in a clever way one step at a time, and really important to have clear goals and knowing ex exactly what you can, and maybe even more, more importantly, what you can't do. We've published a series of blog posts on the Ubuntu design blog, talking about our process and what we did. If you want to read that, we're still writing some things. And please do get in touch if you want to know more about what we've done or if you have any suggestions for us or if you've tried something interesting in your projects. Thank you. What's happening? Well, now, <laughs> now it's time for Q&A. Anyone? Everyone's just too hungry. <clears throat> I just wonder how much markup do you have to touch? Because I can't imagine that it's just a, a, just a few uh, classes for the crit elements. We so. didn't touch the HTML. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, can you hear me? Don't worry. Don't worry. The food is well, ready. <laughs> no? Okay. okay, so I've noticed uh, that that you have shown uh, that you put your uh, your uh, theme or you know the, your framework on the npm. So yeah. I was wondering whether you are using the npm internally to manage uh, parts of your uh, front end. I don't know the answer to that question. The last time that I did a version of this talk, I had some of the developers sitting in the audience and they could answer that question. But um, if, you wanna, if you want to ask on Twitter, then I can ask them and I'll get back to you. Uh, I wanted to ask, where did you get the data about here? <laughs> uh, the data about uh, the usage on the mobile, uh, on my mobile that devices? That was from our Google Analytics. And it was from before the redesign, from before the uh, responsive version of the website? Yeah, that was probably halfway through the project. So we were, we were tracking it, and it didn't really change much while we were doing the project. Yeah, because like, if, you, if you checked it before responsive website, it was probably iPad, because on the phone it was hard to use Ubuntu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah okay. that's true. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you very much.